we're going to be starting the program in a moment here. I'm Matthew Smells. I'm the Director of Programming for Live and Virtual Events here at Education Week. Before we get started, I do have a few housekeeping notes for all of you in the room here and for some of you over on the live stream in the back there watching on edweek.org. If you're in the room with us, select for Wi-Fi access. You'll see there's a sheet of paper in each row, but uh, you see it on the screen here. You'll need to select your network, which is Pew Guest. Today, your username is Guest, and your password well, your password is the one you see on the screen. And again, it's uh, in each row that, as well if you have any questions for that. We should have one of these uh, pieces of paper at the Reg desk in case you're looking for that later. If you plan to tweet about this event, and we hope you all will tweet about the event, especially you all uh, in virtual land out there, use the hashtag LTLF13. That's Leaders to Learn From. Leaders to Learn From 13, LTLF13. As you can see in the back of the room, we do have a live stream audience watching on edweek.org. For all of you on the live stream, we will be taking your questions as well throughout the day. And we will be um, asking you to put those questions in the chat box feature there underneath the screen that you're watching this on. Or again, tweet at hashtag LTLF13. The restrooms for you in the room here is, are down the hallway here. The men's room is the first one on the left, and the women's room is further down the hallway. For those of you who, uh, when, you, when you sit down, you'll see this little yellow sheet in your uh, materials. If you would uh, take the time to fill this out today, we very much value and appreciate your feedback on all of our events, but particularly this event, uh, as we hope to uh, see you again ne next year for Leaders to Learn from LTLF 14, or LTLF 14. And of course, if you could all silence your cell phones, which I need to do as well. Uh, at this point in the proceedings, I'd like to take a very important departure. It's my opportunity to thank our sponsors for this event. Without the support of companies like these, this event and so many of Education Week's other outstanding events would not be possible. Today, these event sponsors are Renaissance Learning and the National, Stu and National Student Clearing House. We hope that you'll take the time to learn about what they provide your schools, your schools and your school districts, as we take the next few hours to discover more about innovative leadership driving those that we're recognizing here today. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's ho host, Virginia B. Edwards, the Editor-in-Chief of Education Week and the President of Editorial Projects in Education. Everyone, Ginny Edwards. Good morning. Welcome to our first annual Leaders to Learn From Forum and recogni Recognition Ceremony. Sorry if that's not grammatical for some of you out there. We talked about that last night. Um, we're very pleased that you've all joined us for what I know will be a very interesting and engaging day as we highlight the outstanding work of 16 district leaders and the strategies they use to achieve their goals. These leaders represent districts large and small, urban, suburban, and rural. To help find them, Education Week put out a call to readers for nominees. We also sought nomination from leaders um, of administrators groups from throughout the nation, as well as members of the uh, Education Writers Association. Education Week's own reporters also identified leaders who are making a mark within their topical beat areas. That's something we think makes this uh, recognition distinctive. In the end, members of the Ed Week newsroom made the final picks. While some of the leaders you'll meet today are nationally known for their accomplishments within their own slices of the education world, they're not necessarily the high profile superintendents who most typically make news. In fact, only nine are superintendents. The rest have worked most of their careers below the radar screen as directors of special ed or transportation, for instance. One common characteristic shared by most is that they have long-standing ties to their communities. They all have a clear vision and of, of how they want to improve their districts, and they follow through on that vision each and every day. The importance of effective leadership goes without saying. Indeed, some research indicates that it's second only to classroom instruction, which is really to say teachers and teaching among all school-related factors that contribute to student learning. So today, we seek to put a spotlight on the importance of exemplary leadership and help spread the word on strategies and tactics that others may want to adapt 
and adopt leaders to learn from. I like that. I, I look forward to meeting and talking with you all today. So please don't be shy about introducing yourselves for those of you I've not met. And as Matthew always, already said, also please uh, feel free to engage in our Twitter conversation about the issues we'll be discussing. The hashtag is LTLF13. So now I'd like to introduce our, the, the 2013 class of leaders to learn from. We begin in Boston, where, as we unfortunately know, uh, it's been a tough week. And so I didn't want to not say that our thoughts and uh, condolences are with the folks there. Even as Boston and its schools over the years have, shared its, have faced its fair share of challenges, it's also produced leaders who are able to step up and make change happen. This is about developing human beings to be productive citizens. It's an enterprise that requires the partnership of home, it requires the partnership of school, and it requires the partnership with the community. Sessions are held at churches. I was a typical parent. I want to know how I can help my child be successful. I want to know how well they're doing in school and what I need to do at home. Uh, trying to make sure that everybody's aware and... I learned that if I was in partnership with the school and if I had the right information and data about my child's progress, that I could better help them at home and that it wasn't too overwhelming. I eventually left the position I was in and opened the first family center in a high school in Boston. I am so proud of you. What we do with Parent University is we want to give parents the knowledge so that they become empowered to be part of with some supports to get you there. Yeah. I discovered that the voices of parents um, really mattered and bringing parents to the table in partnership well with teachers where decisions were made about policy really had an impact. Just so you can have a visual, you all can access it on your emails. Parents of all um, education levels and all socioeconomic backgrounds can understand what's going on, how well their child is doing, what, what their child's strengths are, what their child's challenges are, and things that they can do at home so that they can succeed. Turnaround pilot traditional When they understand yeah. so. that their child has the right to a high quality education, then they can define what their expectations are for high quality education and they can push for that. So, the next question. 20 years ago, Michelle Brooks lost it, in quotes, as the frustrated mother of a Boston high school student. As it turns out, it was the moment that transformed her life. Today, Michelle works inside the 57,000 student Boston system as the assistant superintendent in charge of the district's Office of Family and Student Engagement. One of her high profile efforts, as we just heard, has been launching and overseeing Parent University, a program that educates parents on their roles as teachers, advocates, leaders, and learners. Michelle's work has gained national attention in in part because of her position as a founding member of the District Leaders Network on Family and Community Engagement. Michael Sarbanes, the Executive Director of the Baltimore Schools Office of Engagement, has worked closely with Michelle uh, through the network and had these words to say about her. What I think has been extraordinary about how Michelle has come at the work is a combination of her deep experience working with parents coupled with an understanding of the leverage points around academic achievement and then how to link those up. Michelle's ultimate goal is to create sufficient capacity so their office is no longer needed. If we've done our job right, she says we will not have a job. Michelle, for your leadership in engaging parents, we salute you. Come on up. I'm not sure what Matthew wants us to do, but look, we have a little grip and grin here. Thank you. 
When Jonathan Bryce, the Officer of School Support Networks, was hired in 2008 to tackle discipline reform in the Baltimore schools, about one in five students was being suspended in the 85,000-student 85 85, student district each year. Out-of-school suspensions were contributing to the district's high dropout rate and undermining students' academic achievement. While the vision for overhauling the way students were disciplined came from the superintendent, Jonathan was asked, excuse me, was tasked with turning the vision into reality. He has provided support for all schools by bringing diverse offices together, including human capital, teaching and learning, special education, student supports, facilities and community and family engagement to assist schools in building internal capacity to increase student achievement. The district's chief of staff, Tisha Edwards, labels Jonathan's work as instrumental in revamping Baltimore's approach to student discipline and expanding alternatives for students who break the rules. As Jonathan says, what we did well was change the conversation. The conversation wasn't about suspensions. It was what are the alternatives. The bottom line, he says, is that reducing suspensions keeps more kids in school and actually leads to more student learning. Jonathan, where's Jonathan? Jonathan, I've been looking for you. I get scanning the room for your leadership in addressing student discipline. Please come up. Thank you, Jonathan. <clears throat> I gotta find Patricia. As administrator at Manchester Community College in Connecticut, Patricia Ciccone wondered why so many of her students were not finishing their degrees. She remembers asking, how do we help students make those decisions? Later, as superintendent of Connecticut's technical high school system, she became frustrated by how much of her time and her students' time was lost to discipline issues. She perceived that students were getting lost along the way, the same problem she had seen in Manchester. So in 2006, she worked with principals and others to create a survey of students and staff members at all 16 schools in the system to measure indicators of school climate. Analyzing the survey results helped students in, excuse me, schools in the system set tangible goals for improvement. In a further push to improve school climate, Patricia supported an approach to discipline based on restorative justice that encouraged students to find their way back to school even after offenses. Patricia served as superintendent of this technical high school system from 2003 until retiring in 2012. Doesn't sound like retirement that you went, really went into because now, currently, she's the superintendent of schools in Westbrook, Connecticut. Patricia, for your leadership in improving school climate. A lot of questions when we started really operating differently and I would have other superintendents say well how'd you do that and I thought that was such an interesting question because the only thing I could really say was well you don't do it overnight the employee summit process came together two years ago when uh, Dr. Stevenson and I and our school board presidents attended the uh, labor and collaborative management conference I mean it really is on the last day of that conference the governor came out with pretty uh, substantial uh, funding cuts to public education and we knew that the magnitude of the cuts we were facing were unlike any other that we'd faced here in Jefferson County. As a result of um, being at that conference and I think really being inspired by the stories of other school districts and hearing about their collaboration, I suggested that we do bargaining differently. Carrie and I worked hard together to say, we care about kids, we care about teachers. We may not always agree on how to get to the right outcomes, 
but we know we want the same outcome. It's going to be one, my radius is three. We had had our moments where we didn't agree on much of anything, but by really getting to know each other, by really realizing that we wanted the same things, and we were willing to put the time and the energy into getting there. I think that's how it started. It took time, it took lots of honesty, lots of conversation, um, and knowing each other as human beings. TV. It's important to have a common understanding of the issue that's facing you. Uh, whether you're a union leader or uh, a teacher leader or the district superintendent, you've got to come to that common understanding. It was black, right? You're not going to see a dog walking down One, big G from the other. So they're big G. You really have to think about what matters. And you have to, you have to be really clear on what's going to make a difference for children. Decide what makes the biggest difference. Try to preserve those things. Work together and say, how do we sustain the spirit and the commitment and the purpose of our kids? And if you can do that, you get through the hard times. Uh, it's not easy, but you can get through those hard times. More than anyone, Superintendent Cynthia Stevenson did you like that? No? Yeah, good. Understands what it takes to change and collaborate. So does her t teacher's union partner, Carrie Dahlman, who recently left the local union to assume the presidency of the, na of the state's National Education Association chapter. Asked her number one piece of advice for other administrators, Cynthia cites having a constructive working relationship with local employee associations. Noting she regularly meets with union leaders, she recommends being prepared to give up sacred cows during negotiations, negotiations and using a mediator to help guide discussions. Together, Cynthia and Carrie focus their attention on district union partnerships and in efforts to put students first. Ladies, for your leadership in embracing district union partnerships, labor management partnerships, please join me. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Where's Linda? I want to be able to look. Linda. Veteran educator Linda Hicks took the reins of the city schools in Battle Creek, Michigan in 2010. Capitalizing on its multinational food manufacturers in nearby research and training facilities, she decided to tap the area's potential as a source of future STEM-focused jobs. Among the many steps she took to en enhance the 5,300 student district STEM offerings, two schools were revamped to put the spotlight on STEM very specifically. In addition, she launched a district-wide STEM education panel to help build a strong and sustained vision. Linda, who has 30 plus years experience in education as a teacher, principal, and superintendent, is routinely described as a passionate and hands-on leader who is determined to create meaningful opportunities for disadvantaged young people. Linda says, this is a quote, in education I believe we don't have a day to spare. So people probably think I'm too hands-on, but it's the only way I, I know what's happening. There's no part of my being that accepts that kids are not performing at high levels. Kathy Grosso, the STEM facilitator at Dudley STEM Elementary School, echoes the sentiment. I feel, real, I feel committed to her vision because it's rooted in kids, really rooted in kids, not just saying it. A lot of people say students first, but that is the foundation of everything she does. Linda, for your leadership in STEM education, we'd like to honor you.
One of my favorite stories is a young lady from France came as a student. When her dad first contacted us, he was concerned because he'd been on Google Earth and was not able to find Newcom. And uh, he said, I put in Newcom, New York, but all I see are trees. And I said, well, actually, that is Newcom. I arrived here in 2006 um, to be greeted by 55 students. I realized we had a problem, but the problem wasn't only numbers. The problem was also in that there was a real lack of diversity. I think through trying to deal with two issues at once that I came up with the idea of bringing in international students that would increase our diversity, that would increase our numbers. Little did I know that we would so redefine our school district. I kind of thought that we would have 61 students, they would come, they would go, they'd go on with their lives. I don't think we ever realized that they would become such a part of our families, our school, and our community. <laughs> My wife and I have hosted 10 students over the last six years, and just last year alone, out of the 10 students that we've hosted, nine returned back to visit us. Some people are surprised to hear that the students call us um, mom and dad. I understand that thought, but on the other hand, when you've hosted these students, you do realize they very much become a part of your family to the point where it's very natural for them to call you mom and dad. Students on top of the car. The favorite thing about Mr. Holtz is he's a caring and loving host father because it takes, like, I don't know, to, to host someone from a different country who speaks a different language in your own house and to feed them. It's, it shows love and kindness. <laughs> Uh, my wife and I go to their games. My wife and I take them to the malls on Saturday. My wife and I take them to friends' house and pick them up and do everything that a family would do. <laughs> Students, when they come, they come as kind of foreigners, and but in no time at all, they really do become a part of our school and community. It is a lot of fun. It's, it's they really always think of, of themselves as having come from Newcomb the night of the performance and afterwards when everything Recruiting tuition-paying international students has saved Skip's rural upstate New York district by bolstering its finances and enrollment. And it's changed its culture by exposing Newcomb students to diverse heritage, heritages and languages. It's also redefined the meaning of family to the many residents who have hosted the visiting international students. As Skip says, when you change the culture, you have to go slow. You have to educate and you have to explain what you're doing and for what reasons. We started slow, but it became a cultural norm. Skip, for your le leadership in rural education, we'd like to recognize you. I do think that one aspect of leadership is um, rolling up your sleeves and getting involved. All the stuff that came up. I think some of the things that, that really distinguish the work here in PSJ is a commitment to all students and a commitment to really uh, providing opportunities to every student. The students that we serve are incredible students with, uh, with great potential. The community here, the population is uh, almost 100% uh, Hispanic, about 90% of our students come from uh, economically disadvantaged homes. You know, what we look at is 
focusing on, on our students and on our community, identify the strengths of our students, the strength of our, strengths of our community, and, uh, and build on those. All the staff, uh, when I came to this district, some of the staff alerted me to the fact that, um, that the district had a very, very high dropout rate. It was almost double the state average. And uh, we talked about that openly and uh, publicly, and we put together several initiatives to address that. Every year I go door to door with um, groups of volunteers and go visit dropouts in their homes. Five and a half years ago we opened a dual enrollment high school for dropouts. So we bring dropouts back into high school, get them engaged with a community college, get them, uh, get them focused on a career track where they can earn a, a certification or an associate's degree while we're um, helping them with credits, um, state exams, whatever it is that they're lacking to get their high school diploma. It's like your son, Karian. Through this work over the last five years, we've gone from a, a dropout rate that was about double the state average to one that's less than half the state average. So you've done a terrific job. Our goal is to connect our students to a successful uh, future. You guys are incredible. The way I look at it is every year we have a, a class of students that are graduating that um, don't have time to wait for us to, to get better. I'm very um, optimistic. I believe in students. I believe in the staff, the teachers, the administration. And so I always focus on, the, on what we can do and what we, what, what we as a district can become, what our students can become, what our teachers and leaders, uh, all of us, what, what we can become. I hope everybody in the room heard that. Every year, Superintendent Danny King, along with other educators in his district, goes door to door to visit the homes of dropouts. And this is in a 32,000 student district that covers a wide swath of the Rio Grande Valley. That's a really impressive effort. There were some numbers in that video, but another way to express it is the district's dropout rate, which was twice the state average five years ago, has been slashed by 90% uh, as of last June. Danny, for your leadership in dropout prevention, we'd like to honor you.